Hello, my name is Jason Curtis Paul. I am a Thelemite, and I enjoy reading Friedrich Nietzsche. For two years, I have made a focused effort to study Mr. Nietzsche, truly a labor of love under will. Friedrich Nietzsche is not only Germany's greatest philosopher and greatest European philosopher since Socrates, he is also Germany's greatest writer. Nietzsche is easy to read and difficult to understand. There is no royal road to enlightenment. Welcome to what I have come to call my Nietzschean exorcism. I cannot explain Frederick Nietzsche to you. In fact, I cannot even critique his work. I lack the qualifications. I am not a scholar or a philosopher, but I am a pagan priest, in addition to being a deacon, priest, and initiator, ordained and chartered in the ceremonies and customs of Thelema. I am an artist, and I am an independent researcher, somehow endowed with respect for intellectual integrity. On Thelema, if I know a scant more, it is because I have invested decades more time, and Thelema shines with lustrous clarity. But as I was invited here tonight, to the Temple of the Coiled Splendor, by our gracious host and fearless leader, Mark Shakoyan, to give a lecture on the subject, Nietzsche and Thelema, I will do my best. So without further ado, let us begin to start. There will be a time for questions and discussion after World Cafe. Bio, Friedrich Nietzsche, philologist, philosopher, psychologist, writer, musician, antichrist, and social critic. Date of birth, 15 October 1844, Rocken Belutsen, Prussia. Died 25 August 1900. Early education, all boys and then private school. Nietzsche, as a young student, excelled in theology. This is important as he clearly demonstrates this talent years later in his book, The Antichrist, an absolute first-rate work and critique of Christian theology. His father was a teacher and a pastor, a private tutor to the children of a German prince, and through that connection was made a pastor. Prussian military culture. His father died prematurely when Nietzsche was five. Six months later, Nietzsche's baby brother died. Nietzsche was raised by women. Mother, sister, paternal grandmother, and two maternal aunts. He attended university at Bonn and Leipzig, where he came into the sphere of Richard Wagner as good friends and Arthur Schopenhauer as a philosopher. At 24, Nietzsche accepted tenure at university in Basel, Switzerland, teaching philology. He was made a professor before even writing a dissertation and is still one of the youngest people to ever accomplish this. Teaching philology was not a career goal of his, but rather, it was offered to him. His career goal, as you will soon learn, was to teach philosophy. Nietzsche published his first book, The Birth of Tragedy in the Spirit of Music, as a work of philology. Nietzsche, always the iconoclast, the university and scholarly world of philology had never heard or read anything like it. After ten years of teaching, he retired due to poor health and his desire to write. He left the shackles of the state-run universities to pursue his literary career and teach philosophy on his own terms. That is, to educate the educators. Nietzsche moved to the Swiss Alps, where he lived modestly on his university pension. He loved long walks and meditation in the alpine terrain. He struggled with his health and his eyesight, and he struggled in relationships. But ah, he wrote some of the world's greatest books, and he became one of the world's greatest philosophers. In 1888, Nietzsche suffered a mental collapse in Italy, where he wintered and soon lived in the care of his mother. At her passing, his sister Elizabeth cared for him until his death. 
August 25th, 1900. He was 56 years. Nietzsche respected and adored ancient Greek tragedy, claiming it to be man's highest achievement in art. He thought similarly that ancient Greek culture produced the highest type of man. Thus he referred to the ancient Greeks as the master race, Tragos, the goat song. To own what is being, the most difficult question, Nietzsche answers, being is the eternal return or eternal recurrence of the same. There is a boulder shrine in the Swiss Alps Mark the very spot where the peak of the meditation took place while Nietzsche was out on a hike through the mountains. Eternal return is at the top of a three-tiered hierarchy of valuations. Eternal return, will to power, revaluation of art. Nietzsche overcomes European nihilism and leads us away from nihilistic true world constructs to the world of existence. Nietzsche was able to trace European nihilism back to Plato and describe its various mutations, movements, and mergers throughout 2,400 years of European history. Nihilism means that the highest values devalue themselves. History Lecture How Christianity is the Religion of Platonism and Caesar then God died, and the state was born. 2,400 years of European nihilism and true world constructs. Around 400 BC, Plato's concept of agathos, the good, or form of the good, idea of the good, existing outside of space or time, is posited as the highest value. Next was techne, the artifact. And finally last is Kalitechne, the artist. As Lon says, I need butt resters. This guy makes the plans, this guy makes the artifact, and voila, you have chairs. But notice that in this hierarchy, the chairs are more valuable than the artist that made them. Socrates was the teacher of Plato. Plato was the teacher of Aristotle. Aristotle was the teacher of Alexander. Alexander spent his 17th year living with Aristotle. At 18 years of age, Alexander left his teacher to lead an army to conquer the known world, and he succeeded. Everything in the known world was now going to be done in the Greek language. The Greeks, as occupiers, met the Jews. It was actually a marvelous merging of culture. Agathos, the good, is also known as the One, the Monad, aligning with the Jewish monotheistic god, Yehoe. Agathos equals 284. By asophacy, corresponds to Theos, 284. God, deity. Theos Agathos, the One God is good. Historically, the Greek alphabet with each symbol being a letter and a number, preceded the Hebrew. Further, the tetractus is likely the origin of the tree of life, Aschim. As well as Greek philosophy, the Jews largely learned and then developed Kabbalah from the Greeks, and developed they did. One of the results was Gnosticism. Now the Jews were at the time of the Second Temple. What was being practiced there was nothing like modern-day Judaism. You had many Jewish sects using the temple. That was maintained by the Sadducee, the Jewish aristocracy, for the use of all Jews. You had the mitzvot, the 613 commandments of the Jewish law, but you also had Jewish mystics fired up on Greek Kabbalah, inventing and creating Jewish Gnostic sects and entire Jewish Gnostic communities. Everywhere the Greeks went, Gnosticism followed. Syrian-Egyptic Gnosticism, Persian Gnosticism, and Christian Gnosticism, along with a list called Other Gnosticism. Christian Gnosticism 
is Jewish Gnosticism. Before there were any Christians, the effable name of Jesus, 888, Jesus, already existed as a Kabbalistic construct. His ineffable name is the entire Greek alphabet. I am Alpha and Omega. The Nag Hammadi Library historically supports this hypothesis. Then the Caesar and his Roman soldiers came, and the Greeks were out. From here, things did not go well for the Jews. In 69 current era, the Jewish revolt and subsequent Jewish-Roman war all but annihilated the Jews, and a diaspora for the next 2,000 years lay before them. To me, this war is what happened historically in the first century, and not the virgin birth of a bastard in a manger. The Jews were the only ones waiting for a Messiah, an Old Testament prophet, priest, and king, to lead them militaristically and save them from the Romans. The messianic tradition is theirs alone, and this time the Messiah never came. Who came was the Roman general Vespasian and his son Titus, with legions of Roman soldiers to lay siege on Jerusalem. Joseph Atwill, in his book Caesar's Messiah, puts forth the hypothesis, and I concur, that the New Testament was written in Rome and then backdated as pro-Roman propaganda for the war effort. Written by the turncoat, the captured Jewish general and historian Josephus. Why else would the first ancient Bibles all contain the autobiography of Josephus in the introduction? Jews were crucified by the Romans on both sides of the road leading out of Jerusalem for miles, and Jesus was a popular name. The New Testament and Jesus 888 are Kabbalistic literary constructs, and their story is a typology. The Jews were in revolt because the imperial cult was now deifying the Caesar and required a statue of him in all temples of the empire, some 14,000 of them. The Romans were otherwise very tolerant of other religions. The Jews refused. We are the Jews, no graven image before our God. And they have endured this fate for their defiant self-respect for 2,000 years. Vespasian becomes Caesar and builds the Colosseum with his Jewish war treasure. Vespasian rules the Roman Empire brilliantly. Upon his death, Titus is Caesar, another exceptional leader. Upon his death, his brother Domitian is Caesar. The New Testament is full of dark Roman humor. Titus is the son of God, and his father, the Caesar Vespasian, deified by the imperial cult, is God. To praise Jesus, the son of God, is to hail Caesar. In the Old Testament, the Jewish Messiah was always referred to as the Son of Man and never referred to as the Son of God. The war is over and Caesar Domitian has had enough of the ruse. He outlaws Christianity. But it will not go away. The Christian rabble is getting attention and attention is power and Gnosticism is growing and spreading. To Nietzsche, St. Paul ruins the story of Jesus, how to die without resentment, and the whole thing becomes a rather infantile affair with Paul's cunning. Christ died for our sins, so we don't have to suffer on the cross like he did. Salvation. To Nietzsche, because of St. Paul, there has only been one Christian ever, and he died on the cross. This is where it gets good. The Persians infiltrate the Roman military with a Mithras cult, and over time, its success is complete. Every Roman general has joined. Mithras and pagan to the very core, the Roman nobility. To deal with this problem, eventually, the imperial cult 
was transformed into the Vatican. Caesar Constantine was very nervous and desperate over the Persian Mithras cult in his military, the god of his foreign enemy. Mithraism was so widespread in the empire that literally everything known about it comes from Rome. When it was decided by Caesar Constantine that Christianity was to be the official state religion of Rome in order to replace Mithras amongst his rank and file, it took another 400 years of bribes, coercion, incentives, and laws against paganism with severe punishment to get the conversion. In other words, the Roman pagan generals, the Roman noble caste, flat out refused to convert. This is where a mediocre, Kabbalistic, literary construct is chosen to become culture, law, a way of life, social constructs, institutions, ceremony, and custom. That is, the New Testament. The Holy Roman Empire is born. Previously, you not only needed to be a Roman citizen to be ordained pagan clergy, you needed to be of Roman nobility to be ordained priest or priestess of a Roman pagan god or goddess. This was about to change. The Catholic priest, the arrogant conceit of true world authority, agents of God as if they had had the means and through them only lie salvation, these bigoted castrados, mediators of the poor, sinners, outcast, rabble, at best, mediators of the peasant caste before the aristocracy. Thus, the leveling against privilege begins. What follows? Annihilation of the Gnostics. Annihilation of the pagans. Persecution of philosophers. The Crusades. Betrayal by Pope and Monarch. Secret societies. The Malleus Maleficarum the Middle Ages, the Black Plague, a mini Ice Age, the Renaissance, persecution of the sciences, the Reformation, Luther, Henry VIII, the Church of England, Protestantism, an endless whirl of Christianity fracturing into sectarianism, the Enlightenment, the French Revolution, The leveling against privilege ramps up. Parliaments, democracy, nationalism, communism. Finally, God dies. The autopsy reveals death by acute, absolute categories of reason. But the state is born. Democratic National Socialism, the Russian Revolution, the Reich, Jewish Bolshevism, American democracy, World War I, World War II, Chairman Mao, Korea, Vietnam. Globally, some 160 millions or more people died within the span of two or three generations to war and mass murder. Is this Horus the Avenger? Or have the slaves taken control behind strong psychopathic leaders? out for bloodlust on their masters? Is it simultaneous? A multiplicity of norms. One beautiful, the other a nightmare. We, the people, call conformity to the state progress. Voter fanatics, party convictions, busybodies never satisfied until the whole world understands their petty issues. Insist on shoving it down my throat until I am so full of shit it is coming out of my shoes and I am walking in it. Progress, freedom, equality, altruism, anti-privilege. These values are the very establishment of Christ's kingdom on earth. It is decadence. It is resentment. It is true world constructs. It is nihilism. 
our elected representatives, the new priests and priestesses of the rabble, the underprivileged, the poor, the impotent, the anarchist, the people, the masses. I call it mendacious, democratic, moralist balderdash. Nietzsche was very influenced by this man, Arthur Schopenhauer. European Buddhism, the world as will and representation, desire suffering. Schopenhauer was one of the first Europeans to possess and translate Buddhist doctrine. Nietzsche teaches that Buddhism is active nihilism to Christianity's passive nihilism. Nietzsche, together with his friend Richard Wagner, also a Thelemic saint, internalized Schopenhauer's The World as Will and Representation. These two, along with Richard's wife, Cosima, would often holiday together and discuss this doctrine and accompany Richard to Bayreuth for performance of his symphony concerts and operas. The idea of will as growth took root in Nietzsche, finding a fingerhold on his way out of true world constructs. Eventually, Nietzsche moved on from Schopenhauer and Wagner, writing his own philosophy. Schopenhauer is Aleister Crowley's poster boy for the Black Brothers of the Left Hand Path. Walter Kaufman points out that Nietzsche took care of the small questions, that is, analysis and critique of Christian morals, values, decadence, punishment, etc. Nietzsche was not out to unriddle the universe in a single word. However, will to power accomplishes this ahead of, but aligning with, the cosmology of Thelema. I don't want to be a saint and would rather be a buffoon, Frederick Nietzsche. In 1904, the very elements that make up the cosmos, micro and macro, respond to the work of Frederick Nietzsche by the reception of Liber al Velages through Eowas, a praetor human entity that dictated audibly the manuscript to the scribe Aelister Crowley. The manuscript proclaims the word of the law to be Thelema. Nietzsche is the philosopher of will to power. Thelema means will in Greek. Thelema is potentially a mighty theocracy on the horizon, and Nietzsche is appointed as the first prophet of Thelema and a saint in its liturgy. Nietzsche is a great writer, as is the second prophet of Thelema, Aleister Crowley. Thelema is an aristocratic caste system. Nietzsche avenges aristocratic values, calling for a new aristocracy to rise on the back of socialist democracies. Hinting, prophesizing, this event in his book Will to Power, saying that it is to begin at the end of a 200-year period that will be approximately 2088. Nietzsche, the philosopher, wrote for the individual, opposing the people, herd conformity, the state, Thelema champions these values as a way of life. Nietzsche is a prophet of great wars, as is Aleister Crowley. Nietzsche prophesies the fall of Christianity and the rise of the new barbarians, the noble caste. Thelema replied in the affirmative. Aleister Crowley restored the barbarous names of evocation in Liber Samek his ritual to receive the knowledge and conversation of your true will. Despite its Hebrew title, the barbarous names are in Greek. Nietzsche anticipated a science founded on will to power. Aleister Crowley responded with love under will. In 1908, Norwegian scientist and inventor Christian Birkeland recreates auroral phenomena in his laboratory using his Torella, plasma physics. The Big Bang 
and other such slush as black holes and dark matter are a nihilistic crisis in cosmology, physics, and astrophysics. Nihilism is the order of the day in all Western pursuits. The sciences are no exception. Thelema, will, is a mystical word in the Greek Kabbalah and corresponds to agape, love, both equal ninety-three and lived happily ever after. Not so fast. First of all, Nietzsche refused to use science or mysticism to explain philosophy, and he utterly despised those that did, with great contempt. A huge discord right there with most of the Thelemites I know. They're lost already, as I was when I first started reading Nietzsche. The aspirant stomps their foot and cries, but the second prophet of Thelema, Alistair Crowley, uses science and mysticism to explain everything so cleverly. I hate it already and give up. Yet both of these men are first in bringing scientific method to their fields. And Nietzsche, by taking care of European philosophy, actually freed Alistair Crowley up allowing him to bring Eastern philosophy and Eastern religion to the West. Aylister Crowley received an excellent European education, and he was well studied in the classics as well as European philosophy. And in his book, Magic Without Tears, he gives the command to read Nietzsche. Nietzsche asks the most difficult question in philosophy. What is being? And he answered it clearly and decisively without using science or mysticism. To own, what is being? In Greek, being is spelled on, O-N, our root for ontology, the study of being. This Greek word, on, is the one and the same divine Greek name in the liturgical mass of Thelema, Liber 15. The priest says, Accept this offering upon the waves of Aether to our Lord and Father, the Son, that traveleth over the heavens in his name, On, and kisses the priestess between her breasts on her sternum. To On, what is being? The priestess replies, To me, to me. To me in Greek means what is not, what is nothing, what is non-being, hadit and nuit. I am not a man, I am dynamite, Frederick Nietzsche. Eternal return, will to power, revaluations of art. Nietzsche. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love under will. There is no law beyond do what thou wilt. Thelema, Alistair Crowley. Eternal return of the same, the most valuable content of our consciousness, and I cannot sell it for a nickel, not even to you, and that is the point. It's not in the marketplace, not what might exist if we but believe, but what are we actually conscious of or capable to be conscious of in certainty? To own what is being. Through the false psychology of true world constructs, 2,400 years of nihilism, we are humans so lazy and fucked up we can't even experience our place in existence. The ecstasy, our consciousness, our egos are capable of that is, the value of being a human being in this world. In Thelema, we call her Babylon, the one earth and mother of us all, wherein all men are begotten, and wherein they shall rest. Zarathustra, I beseech you, my brothers, remain faithful to the earth, and do not believe those who speak to you of extraterrestrial hopes. So the plea for faithfulness to this earth did bear fruits. This is the breeding program, not race purity. 
Centuries are required. You can turn man the animal into whatever kind of moral creature you want, if you are patient enough and have enough sustained and grounded force. You can, with some small effort, experience eternal return. I hear borrow from Martin Heidegger. At birth, we step through a gate betwixt the two eternities. On our right, the finite. On our left, the infinite. A being in time, in eternity. Eternal return is not singly, be here now, or a series of nows. That is but one aspect, the present. To hell with the speed of light, instantaneous love under will. To Nietzsche, in order to understand eternal return, one needs a solid grasp of history, the past, and an understanding historically of the times leading up to one's incarnation. We are all products of our generation. No one escapes that. Know thyself. We live mostly in the future. Plans, aims, goals, needs, all that requires forethought. You are coming to this event tonight, and dinner after. To Nietzsche, eternal return can also be experienced as amore fate, that is, lover of fate. Not wanting to change anything that has happened or is to happen, past, present, or future. Standing up to life and accepting the tragedy. Caught up in the whirl of Dionysian ecstasy and... Suffering is a type and part of ecstasy. Saying, yes, I will drink the hemlock to honor my self-respect, without resentment to my circumstances or to the world. Or, I will sacrifice and suffer for my art in order that I may master it. Then will I be empowered, alive and free. Ascetics and training conformist and mediocre, democratic equality of sameness for every man is laziness and nothing else. Its origins are to be found in Christian neighbor love. Become unique, individual, style, distinct, power. And power is what we want. It is certainly what I want. Eternal return. We are being, becoming, will to power. Will to power is eternal return. Power is the essence of will. Power is will to more, will to growth. Vegetable, mineral, animal, all will to more power. Discipline and organization. The will to will, to overcome to sacrifice our old selves for our new selves, to become happiness, a byproduct and degree of our power. And affects, passions, our very organs and tissue electrify spontaneously to carry us involuntarily away and outside of ourselves, suffering fits of anger, joy, love, and hate. Wills fulfilling their particular function in the cosmos, living and doing our will on all planes of existence, physical, emotional, mental, psychological, social, cultural, biological, chemical, atomic, electromagnetic. We are an organism of contending wills, appetites, hungers, cravings, desires, loves, hates, fantasies, needs, choices, consequences, responsibilities. Sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems are conscious and unconscious wills. All other aspects of the soul are defined as wills under the aegis of the will. Happiness a byproduct of doing our will. Not merely Darwinian brutes, survival of the fittest, but development of the highest type of a species. Refinement. 
There is no end game for humanity, no goal or aim for egalitarian mediocrity. But we can develop the highest type, artists, philosophers, religious geniuses. Nietzsche prepared the ground for revaluations of art, not morals or virtues, but a new ground of valuing. Not new values, there are none. Think the Renaissance and ancient Greece. There is no God to punish or reward you, no good or evil, only weak and strong. The strong, that is, those that have kindness, especially for those weaker than oneself. Generosity of spirit, responsibility. Art in its broadest sense. In Greek, techne, our root for technology. Disclosure. The frame for this yurt was hidden in a tree until the artfulness of man found its disclosure. Its ceiling and walls were hidden in rolls of canvas that were once concealed in hemp or cotton plants until the artfulness of man found its disclosure and brought it forth. The bees pollinate, then the flowers fruit. The fruit was hidden in the blossom until the artfulness of the bee brought it forth. Disclosure, an otherwise human activity. ATU 6, the brothers, saying will at mealtimes. The Arab and Jewish custom of breaking bread is the foundation for the brotherhood of man, not democratic values of altruism and egalitarianism, not a god godded out in absolute categories of reason, but the miracle of transubstantiation, turning gross matter into spiritual energy, that is, electromagnetism, that each may do their will. Valuations of the artist. The Übermensch, Beethoven, a life of overcoming. To Nietzsche, a Beethoven will never rise out of the modern world of nihilism. It simply cannot produce the type, the leveling. Nietzsche prophesied that in the modern world of nihilism, the businessman would be the highest type produced by the culture. Not a Napoleon or a Shakespeare or a Goethe. Only the aristocracy has ever produced those types, the highest type of human being. 